Welcome to the Emerging Civil War Podcast. I'm Chris Mikowski, and joining me today is my good friend and colleague, Gary Edelman. Gary, how you doing? I'm well, Chris. How are you doing? I'm doing real well. Gary is the chief historian for the American Battlefield Trust, which means he gets to go all around the country talking not only about cool Civil War stuff, but cool preservation stories. And he's also the vice president of the Center for Civil War Photography. So that gives you a lot of hats, including the one you're wearing now. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I change him as I need to. <laughs> He's a multi-faceted hat man, multi-hatted hat man. So, um, so Gary and I had the opportunity recently to collaborate on a project called The Cost of War, which is being offered right now as a special premium for folks who take advantage of the opportunity to donate to a current campaign going on from the American Battlefield Trust. Um, Gary, tell us a little bit about The Cost of War and what this project was. Yes. Yeah, so, so first of all, let me say that uh, when you want to take someone you already know, and then if you want to get to know them a little bit better, their capabilities and their peccadillos, do a little book together and you get to know each other a little bit better for sure. And I think in this case for the positive. Um, in any case, you know, it's no, sur no surprise that the trust is a fundraising organization. We you know, need to raise money to save land and, and tell stories. Uh, that's our mission. And, you know, sometimes we need to incentivize people to go a little bit further. And that is where this was born. In other words, you know, this isn't Gettysburg. This is Spotsylvania, Corinth and Champion Hill. Very interesting places, big following for these, but not as much as, as, as our need was going to be for this project. So I suggested that me and another uh, put together some sort of a small book that summarizes the cost of war, uh, those four, those three battle battles saw more than 45,000 casualties. And a lot of this stuff is visually documented, not just the human toll, but also the prisoners, the wounded, the landscapes, the cities. And then, of course, you have cemeteries associated with it. So it was born there. And Chris and I worked together to assemble little sections, as I just described, and tried to visually depict them in a summary format. Now, the the three battles that you just mentioned you said the uh, very important they don't get the, the sort of spotlight that a place like gettysburg does but champion hill for instance at vicksburg arguably the key battle of of one of the key campaigns why is it that a, why is that a place that tends to get forgotten about well at least you know people out west well, if that's the west anything west of pennsylvania west virginia and, and virginia um, and Maryland for purposes of the Civil War, you know, even during the Civil War, it was very frustrating to Abraham Lincoln and many others where there were all these Union successes in the West, but fewer newspapers, uh, fewer population centers, fewer photographers, fewer reporters. And throughout the whole war and to this day, the West sort of struggles for recognition compared to the big Eastern events. I mean, I still, my favorite example is that the Union captured something like 100,000 square miles of territory in early 1862. And that's great and all, heralded his big victories. And then Robert E. Lee wins, sort of wins a couple of victories, maybe doesn't lose a couple. And it's as if none of that ever happened. And Washington is flipping out. And Abe Lincoln couldn't believe it. It's like he was losing the war just because of a couple of reverses in Virginia. Uh, I don't think that's fair, but it is true. And, you know, I think about Spotsylvania, where it's, you know, it's the fourth bloodiest battle of the whole war, and people hardly know about it, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. off the highway, and, and you've got to kind of go searching for it. Interesting that you say fourth. I put it third at 32,000 casualties. Do you put something ahead of Spotsylvania? Something like? Uh, Chancellorsville. You so put I, Chancellorsville like, ahead. Gettysburg, Chickamauga, Chancellorsville, and Spotsy is how that I That sounds like a you and Chris White effort. I've noticed the casualty <laughs> figures for that third day, especially really climbing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Get higher and higher. Um, but it, that actually kind of gets to one of the things that we talked about in the, the book is, is the number of casualties and how do you count casualties and how do you count yeah. the dead? And, and uh, uh, the number of killed has been something that, uh, you know, it's just a staggering number, no matter what number you put it at, commonly accepted at 640,000. Tell me, how do you how do you wrap your mind around a number that big? Well, first of all, let me just say that I just think that I don't think people who haven't given this a lot of thought know how complex it is to know any of these numbers, given the burning of a lot of the Confederate records, given that these tallies aren't taken every day, and given how people are moving around and the record keeping didn't allow for the databasing that we enjoy today. So even knowing how many people were in 
a whole army or units was is next to impossible at any one time, uh, let alone, you know, when you're fighting multiple engagements, skirmishes, uh, battles, followed by campaign with sickness of knowing what happened to everybody, especially if you're only taking these tallies, you know, periodically every week, every month. Um, or more, and people are always dying, adding to the record record keeping difficulties. So we just don't know. There are things we know. We know a lot of the dead in the ground. Uh, we have a lot of good reports and rosters, and a lot of work's been done since the war as well. But nobody has arrived at a perfect figure, or even close to perfect figure for the war, as far as we know. This 620,000 one, 360,000 Union, 260,000 Confederate, you know, sort of was the attempt of a couple of early people, Fox and Livermore, to try to get at this. What assumptions do we need to make to understand what counts as a Civil War dead uh, person, a, a killed? What, what if somebody's wounded and eight months later, they sort of die of disease? I know you deal with this with Stonewall Jackson. Was it a mortal wound or was it pneumonia mm -hmm. um, itself? So, so even categorizing and making assumptions and then trying to figure out how the different armies counted casualties, what counts as what? And therein lies the challenge. We know 620 is imperfect, but some of you may have heard that, of course, in about 2011 or 12, uh, someone came up with this idea of using censuses. He was a statistician, and he came up with a higher number, which very well could be true. But his number was so broad, something like from 620 to 850, and it included civilians inherently. And I just I haven't bought that necessarily more than the initial number that was seemed to be more focused on the, the battle dead. And uh, you mentioned civilians, too. And like, you know, that's a lot harder to count as well. Um, you know, and, and what's natural causes? What's a cause of the war? What's yeah. uh, emotional trauma versus physical trauma? So, you know, these numbers are so hard to get at. Yeah, if I can, what happens if a, a family simply starves because their breadwinner isn't home? Um, you know, there are a number of of instances that we'll never be able to count. And when I say a number, I mean tens of thousands where we just won't know exactly what the cause is. A lot of us heard about this with COVID. Oh man, you're sick with COVID. You're sick with something else. How do we call it? And then politics get into it. And certainly politicians are aware of the death roster and the body count and the war list in every war. I think about the instance that we, we talk about in the book where Governor K. Warren, after the first day of the Battle of the Wilderness, fudges his numbers. He basically says like, People would not be able to tolerate um, that number of casualties. You've got to bring that down yeah. um, just what, by smudging what, the paper. Yeah. What, uh, my God, what will the country say, said yeah, Abe Lincoln, right? Uh, just at a loss and such a severe loss. So is that Fredericksburg or Chancellorsville? Uh, that was Chancellorsville. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, you know, the third bloodiest battle of the Civil War. <laughs> um, so you know, I know this is the cost of war discussion. We shouldn't have too much fun, but. It was a while ago, and we can both trend serious and a little bit light on this subject. Sure, sure. And it is one of those things that, uh, you know, people tend to forget that they're, they're like real people behind these numbers. And, you know, they you know make it so abstract that they forget that these are individual people with individual stories and families. So when, when you and I started talking about, like, what does that actually translate into as a cost of war? That really opened up some interesting things to think about, I thought. Yeah, yes, indeed. And we, we, we all try to do this, right, to, to talk about, you know, how hard this war hits across the country. We all try to get it out there better. We try to tell stories. We try to visually depict it. We try to go to places and say this happened here. And it all, you always come up short because how do you describe a life or a, a livelihood, you know, when somebody loses a limb or something like that? But that doesn't stop us from trying. Uh, and, and this is one of the downers of our situation. You know, I mean, I, when I tell stories of the last moments of some of these people, fathers holding sons for the last time, uh, you know, and watching them perish, family members, tear jerking letters. It's terrible. But I mean, I think that falling more under the radar beside all these just ridiculous hundreds of thousands of deaths themselves, it's all of these people whose lives were permanently impacted from their wound, from their prison experience, from losing their home in Hampton, Virginia or Chambersburg, Pennsylvania or uh, Richmond, Virginia or Charleston, Columbia and any number of other cities that really felt it. So it's it, what a subject I'd been wanting to do something like the cost of war. Uh, for many years, uh, like many of my book projects, it hadn't come to fruition, much unlike your ECW host today who puts out a book a week. Uh, I'm writing one now. So, so I'm really happy that this came out 
uh, that this is coming out. Uh, Chris and I have seen it. Y'all haven't seen it yet. Um, but I, I, I'm really pleased with trying to provide a summary, trying to get at some of these stories. This is what we're supposed to do as historians. What I thought was really neat was, was you know, basically you came to me and said, look, I've got this idea. And, and you talked about your organizational structure a little bit. You had pictures picked out. But that was kind of where we started. It was like, you know, and, and let's make this turn into something. Where did the idea come from to get it to that point? And then as you started working with a collaborator, how did that idea crystallize for you? Yeah, that was interesting. First of all, I'll say that anybody who works with me sometimes knows that the idea is there. The idea is formed in my mind, but not with great specificity. I just know it's going to be great. And, 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 and the specifics aren't always there yet. So you experience some of that. What I'll say is that for years, the, re, the, the book I had in mind early on was The Cost of War, was focusing only on the dead. And I specifically meant the dead that were photographed. Um, we have, depends on the count, what you count as a Civil War dead photo. I'm not talking about post-mortem photos, nor um, you know people in you know coffins and things like that. I mean, battlefield dead or hospital dead. Um, about 104 photos that we have, plus a bunch of drawings like that. And in those photos, maybe you have 250 unique corpses or people um, actually depicted. And I thought about this idea of analyzing that body of work. And as I started getting into it, I realized that, I mean, that's just part of the story. What about the wounded? What about the prisoners? So I started thinking about a visual summary of Civil War casualties, this project, because the trust is a battlefield group, we started thinking, well, what about the battlefields themselves? They were cemeteries. Many of them remain cemeteries. And that's basically the categories that we outlined is, you know, landscapes and cities, prisoners, wounded, dead, and then, of course, the cemeteries themselves. And to me, that created a really neat narrative flow um, through pictures, you know, to talk about like the waging of the war and, and what it did to the landscapes. And you pick some really interesting uh, and I think shocking landscape pictures to look at that show devastation in different sorts of ways. Um, yeah. What is it about that, that, I, you know, like, again, people see pictures and they, and they again, think abstractly, but some of these are extremely evocative photos. Um, what is it that draws you to pictures like that? Yeah. So first of all, I'll say that, you know, it. I was the way you're describing it is, you know, I'm very much the photo curator of the book. Like I wanted to take them. I had in mind what I wanted to be, what shape they wanted to be, which ones would span two pages and everything like that. And the rest, you know, you were kind of looking to me for direction. I was like, I don't know. You're the writer. And that's where you really added a lot of value. You wrote you know, what, 90% of the book or 85% of the book. I added some photo details in the captions, things I wanted to say and juxtapose um, behind it. So that was a real fun process. Sometimes you were trying to get out, go to get at what I meant, you know, in putting those photos there at the same time that I was trying to understand what you were trying to do. So that was a lot of fun. And this was our first project of this sort together. Yeah. Um, what I'll say is that in doing a visual summary, I mean, my way, if anybody's ever been on my tours or seen some of my extravaganzas, you know, uh, PowerPoint presentations, most people put 40, 10 photos in their extravaganzas. I'll put 190, 220 and cruise through them in the hour. I want to show and demonstrate the nature of these photos and show as much as possible. Um, and that's how I am on my tours too. In this case, man, I was forced to try to come up with things that wouldn't overlap too much. You know, if you can only have 12 or 13, 14 photos of the dead, which ones out of those 104? are you going to pick to give a summary of the different types of experiences? And Chris, uh, to get at your point for the landscapes, I wanted to show, you know, how landscapes harmed cities uh, and why. Uh, and you talked about that really well in the captioning, how, and then the landscapes themselves, denuded of trees replaced with earthworks. And you can see the trees as part of those earthworks. Um, and, you know, and of course, just the scarred landscapes, uh, you know, that you could say some of this idea came from Megan Kate Nelson's excellent book called Ruin Nation, which really took uh, land, trees, uh, cities, and bodies and sort of looked at how the nation was ruined by Civil War. Very cool uh, uh, look at it. And maybe in the back of my mind, this is what was behind some of my photo selections as well. Yeah, I mean, most people don't realize that the the war was just an environmental catastrophe of incredible proportions. You know, seven million acres of forest just 
totally deforested and uh you know erosion and the way that these guys are digging and digging and digging and you know stripping land and uh you know and, and i think that the the photos that that you curated there really showed in, in a very to me visceral way um just how powerful that catastrophe was well, and we, we just we had so few opportunities to do it. But in many of those cases, we can visit those places. And of course, you and I were cognizant about, you know, including photographs where you could go to the place, whether it be Petersburg or Vicksburg or Gettysburg, Antietam, Spotsylvania, um, Corinth and, and many others. Um, but even some of them, we included a couple, not many, just a couple of modern photos of the same spots to have that then and now match to demonstrate that these places are the same. And one of my favorite ones is just, you know, these hospital men in a hospital, uh, men of Kearney's division, it's captured as uh, in Fredericksburg itself. And when we moved sort of with permission, some of the furniture aside at that place behind what is now a real estate office, there's still some whitewashing on the wall. That Chris White had kind of showed to me and it's there in the photo and there it is. And you can sort of see it. So as inconsequential to actual casualties or cost of war that might be it's another way to sort of connect and maybe allows you to get a little vision that's what it was like i see the whitewashing i see that door i'm standing at the same place uh with permission keep that in mind um and and now i feel a little bit closer maybe i understand civil war and its cost a little bit more and that's what we do right uh, you know my goal is to have somebody in the audience if it's 10 people all the better aha that's what it was like. Now I understand a little bit better. And I think that's how I came to this subject. Uh, bit by bit, sentence by sentence, photo by so photo, I tried to understand what it was like. And now I try to convey it. And inherently we fall short, but we try. Yeah, that evocative power of place and, and the trust is so effective at putting people in those places and, and helping them connect these things. And, you know, you've talked to me in the past about how photos are such a powerful tool to help make those connections. And, and people have different ways of, of making those connections. Uh, I think probably, and this is, was a real gift that you gave to me that I think the most important thing I learned from you um, a couple of years ago was just how much these photos show if you take the time to explore them as opposed to just giving them a quick glance because they were in such high resolution they contain so much information uh, and i appreciate you giving me that that gift of, of insight tell us a little bit about why those photos have so much in them yeah well so first of all um, i'm glad that makes me crazy happy um to hear too um you know i have sort of viewed it when i give a tour when you give a tour, like, you know that there's somebody in the group that's interested in buildings and somebody who likes birds and someone who likes books and somebody who likes landscapes and someone who wants the blood and guts, you know, especially when you have a group. So I'm just trying to throw out a, a variety of things to the people in a storytelling fashion to open windows of the past so that they can say, now I get it, right? And I think photographs are a great way to do that. Literally, they can be windows, especially when viewed in 3D. And most photos of the Civil War were taken in 3D. So I also view, I was trained at History Associates and at uh, Shippensburg University, look for intersections, right? So you have this event, a battle, a campaign, a war, and where does it intersect with what people wrote down, okay? Now, if you take that intersection and make it a six way, where do you have photographs of it? Where do you have maps of it? Where do you have this? And all of a sudden you have like a 12 pointed star going into one moment sometimes. And I think photos are good for that. The, the reason we can go so far into photos is because of, as you said, unparalleled revolution, uh, resolution. This is not a pixelated image. This is not an image with any grain, like most of us grew up with the 35 millimeter ones. And on top of that, those 35 millimeter uh, negatives were about an inch and a quarter by less than an inch. Um, the glass plates of the Civil War were meant, most of them double plated stereo plates, four by 10 inches. And there were other ones that were seven by nine inches, 63 square inches, okay? Except there's a sweet spot, you know, around the middle. This idea of a vignette was real during the Civil War. You know, you have that vignette and then you have the sweet spot in the middle. And you'll see in our, in our book, folks, uh, it's not a word I use very often, good friends of ours, people. Um, in the book, you're going to see that we cropped out a lot of the edges. We cropped out a lot so that you can see. So the things deep in the photos jump out at you because there's no grain and because there's no pixel, you can zoom in. I don't want to say endlessly. I don't want to quite say to the molecular level because that's all that's really stopping you. I mean, in the end, an image can only show so much, but once you all who are watching this and you're getting skeptical, 
and take your SLR camera and see someone's fingerprints from 15 feet away, then we'll talk about the best resolution of the Civil War. Then you can talk about how your camera might provide something similar to that. So, um, you know, this allows us to show things that the photographer never meant to show from dung on the ground to somebody smiling in the background to a bayonet that's not properly affixed to the rifle to some horse doing its business or anything like that. You could just start to see things that normalize the people and the places in those photos in a way that the books we first looked at these photos in uh, would not possibly do. Now, that also raised, I think for me, uh, an ethical issue as we curated photos and looked at it, because that level of detail can make some of the images of the dead especially graphic. And yeah. on one hand, you know, talking about the cost of war, let's get it all out there and show what it really is. But on the other hand, audiences may or may not be able to tolerate that. Um, how do you look at that? that space and figuring out as a photo historian yourself, um, what helps you tell the story you need to tell? Yeah. I mean, you know, first of all, I think that generally speaking, despite what we see in politics these days, and as we have our whole lives, people can handle a lot more than we give them credit for. Um, another thing I'll say is that ethically, I mean, I wish it was only confined to which graphic images we should use, but rather, you know, I noticed that, you know, photo colorization. Is it okay to color a photo? Is it sacrilege? What about cropping a photo like I regularly do on social media and sometimes in this book? Is that okay? Disrupting the initial, you know, uh, sort of vision of the photographer, um, you know, and then when it comes to curating these things, I mean, this is a book about war and you know that we really struggled with whether or not we should have a graphic photo on the cover. Um, and we do, we have an exhumation um, situation, but there are limits and there are much more graphic photos. I'm thinking of one or a couple of particularly bloated, in some cases, eaten by animals or disemboweled by animals, photos that we could have included and didn't. Um, this is a visual summary. That is not the, the norm. Bloating is the norm. By the time the photographers got there, especially in a summer battle, you're going to have disfiguration as putrefaction starts to take hold of a body. And, you know, and even in terms of the prison photos, I mean, some are nastier, grittier, and look rougher than others. Uh, but we felt we had to include Andersonville, Elmira, um, you know, and so many of these other places, some less known like uh, Camp Marion uh, and in Indiana, I believe it is, and, and other ones in there. We wanted to really show, you know, uh, this sort of a, a, a broad, we were going for the big and broad to try to give examples rather than trying to shock. I mean, I don't think also the members of the trust need to be shocked. Most of them have been uh, interested or obsessed with this subject for a long time. Um, so we thought that the best way would be to provide a summary without going full shock value. One of the questions that I often get when I'm giving a tour, and I'm sure that you've encountered this as well, is, is someone will ask, what do they do with all the bodies? After the fighting was done, what did they do with all the bodies? And and I think that the, the section that we have on cemeteries was especially poignant because it you know helps answer that question. Um, and to me, that you know, it might be my favorite part of the book because it was just so reflective for me and so poignant for me. Um, you know, how do you deal with that question when when folks pose it to you? Yeah, I mean, I am pretty, uh, I'm pragmatic about a lot of questions. What did they do with them? Well, they put them in the ground next to where they died. They threw some dirt over them and they exhumed them at some point in many cases. You know, uh, I answer those things. Of course, tours are limited in time and you want to provide the information, you know, that people want as quickly and they'll often ask follow-up questions. So that's sort of my answer. But this idea that you deal with too with the dead is, you know, we know who won the Civil War. Uh, we know who controls the national cemeteries and we know who is going to have the resources to move those dead, those remains to national and other cemeteries first. So in the South, you have a lot more unknown um, dead because they remain in the ground without dog tags. There's no dog tags in the Civil War for a while. So you're going to have a lot of unknown dead, a lot of smaller cemeteries. It's a lot more work to find, you know, sort of the Southern dead. One thing I want to conclude with uh, on this question is that I really enjoyed how you and I started wondering how we could wrap this up. Like we went to the dead, we got the cemeteries, we d had decided to put a cemetery on the back cover, the beautiful McGavick Cemetery at Carnton in Franklin. Um, but but what are we really trying to do and say at the end? That was one of my favorite parts of it. There was a lot of creative stuff that was going on quick while we were trying to do this because uh, Chris 
how long did we take to bang out this book roughly from start to end? Yeah, just a couple of weeks. <laughs> that might be slow for you, but for me, that's pretty fast. Over um, Christmas too. So, you know, all the holidays <laughs> stuff and New Year's and, you know, and all that stuff. Yeah. So. And let me thank Jeff Griffith for the awesome cover. Uh, he designs a lot of trust stuff. And then, of course, Sarah Canfield and Chris White of the trust staff, as well as Bob Zeller and John Richter for making some of those images a, a lot better. I mean, Bob had a discussion with me, something to the effect of, well, if you want your images to look like crap, by all means, use the ones you have. So <laughs> there's another ethical thing. Are we supposed to clean up a photo to make it more look like it did at the time when it was recorded? Or are we supposed to leave the specs and dots uh, as the negative has inherently deteriorated over time. So if folks want to get a copy of The Cost of War, how do they go about doing that? Yes, yeah, so there's only one way. Now, I can't say for sure that this book will not be for sale to the trust store and a bookstore later, but our current plans is just you can only get one with this appeal. It's not really long enough for our normal distributor to distribute it. Chris and I have talked about, hey, we can make it longer and put it out for sale, but for now... We only ordered enough that we think we need for the appeal. And if you donate $60 to the trust, that triggers you get an automatic book. If you donate less, we'd still appreciate that. If you donate nothing, thanks for listening. And uh, we appreciate your consideration. But if you donate $60, you'll be helping to save uh, portions of Spotsylvania, Champion Hill, and Corinth battlefields. And you'll also get a cost of war book sent to you, I don't know, about a month or so. It could be six weeks. It's never quite as quick as people want right afterwards. So uh, that's the only way to get it. You go to battlefields.org, click preserve, and then it'll probably be the first appeal under preserve there. Or I think Chris will probably include the link directly to um, that appeal so you can learn more about what we're trying to do. We always have maps about uh, the land we're trying to save and what sort of battle action happened there. Um, and then maybe you can get the book. And we appreciate your consideration and your support of battlefield preservation and what, Chris? And education. Good, good. <laughs> what else you've got, man? So, you know, and we, we're talking on these big sort of sweeping philosophical things and, you know, some, some pragmatic issues. And it was funny, you'd mentioned uh, Chris White a moment ago because he read the thing and he said, you never actually said what the cost of war was in dollar signs, which of course really was what we were getting. It was a good point. Like, you know, it actually was a literal cost of, and, and we're doing that. I'm going to recite just a couple numbers so that we make sure that we cover that here. The, uh, you know, 5.2 billion dollars uh, for the u.s government or went to disproportionate cost for those southern states versus the northern states um you know just a huge huge uh, impact so but yeah. uh you know we we're sort of thinking more along that that you know how do you quantify that number of dead how do you quantify those those injuries that experience in the prison um hopefully we gave folks some things to to think about well, yeah, I think, and and uh, if uh, I'm not sure if that was me blaring out there because of my internet, or if it's Chris's uh, right there, but we'll throw some photos up if any of that went uh, a little wonky for a second there. You know, I think, you know, in as much as you and I don't have the answers on the cost of war, we try, we try to come up with numbers, uh, we try to recite the best scholarship we can, we try to tell the stories of some of the people involved so we can understand it better. But I think this book booklet and uh, other efforts like this, they really, all they do is set the table for people to try to make their own sense of it. Uh, I mean, you know, to this day, we're still trying to make sense of the Civil War and then throw in where you're from and your politics, and it gets even more complex. So I think that we ask as many questions without directly doing so as we answer, Chris. Uh, which to me, I think, yeah, you know, again, gives people that spot in that intersection the 12 13 14 point star here's one more set of questions to to give you to think about so yeah yeah gary i appreciate the chance to chat with you a little bit today about the cost of war um it's great to uh talk with you as always man i'm looking forward to whenever we hit a battlefield again together we're just back from uh one or two ourselves and you know emerging civil war has become such an important part of what we do at the american battlefield trust emerging rev war as well uh, i see y'all on a regular basis and i'm so glad you all are doing what you do well thank you very much for the opportunity to collaborate because you guys are just wonderful wonderful partners and i'm always looking forward to the next chance to be out on the battlefield with you <laughs> all right it's a love fest everybody it thanks so much is. for watching <laughs> so uh, on behalf of gary i'm chris wikowski thanks so much for being with us we'll see you online
and on the battlefield. Thanks.